Thank you very much, Glenn. And and thank you for having me here today. This is a real pleasure to be to be doing this. Um, I guess, Glenn, maybe the next slide now I can sort of bring up the title of the presentation. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying something a little different today to the, the presentations that I've traditionally done here. Um, as, as Glenn said, I've worked with the RIPE-NCC for a long time now, about 15 years actually. Um, and RIPE-NCC is a regional internet registry, among other things, um, and I will get into what exactly that means as I, as I talk through this. Um, but if you maybe, so managing the network of networks, ongoing evolution in the governance of internet infrastructure is the title here. Um, and I, I think part of what I want to focus on is that evolution and that possibility for development and change in, in how a multi-stakeholder internet governance approach actually works. Um, if you jump to the next slide, please, Glenn. So yeah, infrastructure. <laughs> um, I guess when, when you think of infrastructure, or when, when I think of infrastructure, it tends to look like that for the internet. There's a lot of cables, a lot of um, pipes, a lot of, a lot of ports, things getting plugged in um, to each other. Now, my background is not the, the kind that's going to get too deep into that. Um, I, I came from more of a communications background um, and, and worked initially for APNIC, which is also another regional internet registry in Australia, where I'm from, uh, and then moved to the RIPE NCC. Um, but looking, I think, at the um, page, on, on the page for this, this presentation and sort of a lot of the content that was already there, a lot of the resources, what's really clear is just how broad that idea of infra infrastructure yeah. for the internet is. Um, it, it really it covers a huge diversity of, of different um, kinds of infrastructure, both from the very physical to the more sort of esoteric um, idea, uh, and that's some of what I'll be talking a bit about today. Um, Glenn, if you jump to the next slide here, yeah, I, <laughs> I perhaps wasn't thinking in terms of the, the ebook or the PDF when I printed this out, so I unceremoniously cut off um, this with a big white white patch here. It was supposed to sort of dissolve in in a very artistic way. But I'm assuming that this is a, a graph or a chart that has been shown to you before um, during this, this um, internet governance school or that you may have seen before on the internet somewhere. It's a graph that the Internet Society actually developed, I think, in around 2016. Um, and it really tries to show all of the different elements and players that make up internet governance. Um, I've chopped off half of those, uh, which included local, national, regional, global policy development, it included capacity building, it included um, end users actually. But what we're left with here with just this half, naming and addressing, open standards development, shared global services and operations, is I think what probably counts as infrastructure. The internet infrastructure. So it's really it's it's half of that whole group is is devoted to um, different kinds of infrastructure. Now, the other interesting thing to note about this, um, and if you go to the next slide, then here I had it presented in a slightly larger font, um, is that you, you you start to notice that there are actually some names and some words or concepts that get duplicated here. Um, it it as complicated or as confusing as that graph might look, it's actually more confusing <laughs> than you probably thought in the first place. Um, so you have CCTLDs there in both naming and addressing and um, shared global services. You have ICANN um, there, but it's also appearing in, in some other spaces as well as a root server operator, for instance. Um, the RIPE NCC actually that I work for is one of those organizations that fills multiple slots in, in this infrastructure um, overview. So we serve as a regional internet registry. We serve also as a root surfer operator. Um, we work with network operators. We work very closely with internet exchange points. We engage in the IETF. We're actually members of the ITUT, which is the standardization section of 
um, the International Telecommunication Union. Um, so there is a huge amount of interplay and cross-pollination between all of these organizations. So when we talk about, when, when we make an, an attempt to do a 45 minute presentation um, on internet infrastructure, yeah, it was a case of choosing, okay, what, what are we going to look at here? What's actually going to be the message and how do, how do we sort of make sense of all of this in a, in a relatively succinct kind of way? So if we jump to the next slide, oh, actually, I, I'm sorry, I'll, before that, I'll say one point that just because you may hear me making reference to it um, later in the presentation, I-Star organizations. When you hear the word I-Star organizations, it's a concept that we've used to define really a, this group of, of organizations that provide all this, these different kinds of infrastructure services. Um, it, it's not really a formal group. There is no sort of, this is an I-Star organization, this is not. Um, but essentially it includes those sort of public organizations um, that uh, uh, fulfill a role of in, in terms of internet infrastructure and internet governance. Okay, sorry, so next slide. So what I decided to try and do here is to really work a bit from the RIPE NCC perspective, um, since that means I have the information to hand and, and can probably pull it together quite, quite simply. Um, so I wanted to give first a bit of background on what the RIPE NCC actually is. Um, now we're a not-for-profit membership association under Dutch law. That's what a lawyer would, would call us. That's how we would be identified. Um, so we're based in Amsterdam. We were founded in 1992. And one of the primary roles we have is the Secretariat of the RIPE community. So the RIPE community first started to meet, and it's an, it's an open community. It's a, an open group of people with an interest in IP addresses and IP networks in, in this region. Um, they started meeting in 1989. And in 1992, or leading up to that, they decided that it would be useful to have a formal organization um, to help serve them as secretariat. Now, around that time as well, what they decided was that it would be useful to have the RIPE NCC serve as regional internet registry. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more shortly about what that actually means. But um, for now, one of the important things is, is that our, we serve very specifically users and members in 76 countries. Um, and you can see that in the purple shading there on the map. Uh, we also operate KROOT, which is one of the 13 root name servers. Um, that will be something I delve into a little bit more later in the presentation. Right now we have around 160 staff. Um, we've been growing slowly for the last few years, but I think we're probably not going to grow too much more at this point. Um, and while we do have our base in Amsterdam, and that's where most of our staff are located, we do also have an office in Dubai, and we have uh, some office space in Moscow. Um, which means that we're better able to serve some of our members in, in those parts of the world. Um, so that's, that's important to note. So if we jump to the next slide, Glenn, thanks. So what I wanted to do with today's presentation, and keeping in mind that the overarching idea here is to think about internet governance in this infrastructure space and the way those governance processes evolve and match the needs of, of infrastructure. And I wanna break it down into three quite specific things that have been very, um, the RIPE NCC itself has been very involved in. Um, one, and this is, as I say, one of our fundamental reasons for being, um, is IP address management and the regional internet registries. Um, I'm gonna get into a little bit about what IP addresses actually are and why the internet, regional internet registries exist. Um, hopefully I'm not going over too much of what you've already heard. Um, the second one is the root server system. And as I say, RIPE NCC plays a role there as one of the root server operators of, of KROOT. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that. And finally then the IANA stewardship transition, which I'm sure I'm going to be repeating some of what's, what's been discussed in previous calls, um, hopefully from a slightly different perspective or a slightly different um, view, but uh, yeah, it, it's certainly one of the major internet governance events of the last decade, and, and it's useful to 
um, provide a perspective on, on all of this and how it progresses. So, ready to go then, and I'll jump straight into the first part here. The internet protocol is everywhere. Uh, this is a slide, actually it's a combination of two slides, that uh, myself and my colleagues have used many, many times as a sort of, where do we start with what the RIRs do? Um, internet protocol is basically the definition of the internet. There are many kinds of networks, there are many kinds of machine protocols out there. Internet protocol, which was developed in sort of the 60s into the 1970s, really defines what we know as the internet. The internet is connections that are made using the internet protocol. And that protocol allows packets of data, not date there, sorry, that was my, <laughs> my typo, packets of data to move across the network, to move from one part to the other. And it, it has a number of implications there. Um, one is that those the internet protocol itself doesn't care what's in those packets. Those packets are chopped up into um, un, unreadable, usually unreadable um, fragments of data which are put back together by the machines at the end of the network. The network itself doesn't pay attention. Its only concern is getting those packets of data from one address to another address. Now, the other aspect there, and this plays very much into the regional internet registries, is that in a global network, the addresses need to be unique. And that's very a, a concept that is very similar to, say, a postal service. If you send something to this address, this street number, this street name, this postal code, you need to be sure that that's where it's going. If there's another street with the same name, same postal code somewhere else in the world, and your packet might end up going there, then that's a problem. That's going to mean that that's not a, a very useful means of communication. So ensuring that uniqueness is something that the regional internet registries are really set up to ensure. Now, I also want to point out here this um, hourglass model. And again, it's probably something you've heard before. Um, it's a model that was developed by, it's called the OSI model, developed in 1984 by the International Organization for Standardization. Um, and I don't want to get too far into it, but I want to really emphasize there what we call the narrow waste. Um, so that middle part, where you see at the bottom layer with physical um, physical means of communication, or the top layer, which is talking much more about lots of different applications, it gets wider. There is huge diversity. The internet allows for that kind of innovation of doing lots of different things. But what's required for the internet to work is to have that narrow waist, to have everything at the end of the day come back to the internet protocol and transmitting data via the, the internet protocol. That's what ensures all of these different services, all of these different means of sending data are interoperable and can work together in a single global network of networks. Um, so that's something that a lot of the infrastructure is really dedicated to ensuring that interoperability, that the internet will actually work as a single internet, as a single network. Um, now, in many senses, the what the RIRs do with IP addresses should be straightforward because IP addresses are numbers. That's it, they're just numbers. Um, and, and we manage and allocate and register those numbers. Um, unfortunately, it's not, quite as simple as that. And if we jump to the next slide, you'll see at least one very significant complicating factor, um, which is that there are two flavors of IP address. Um, this is, well, I did an interview for a job at APNIC when I started in 2003, um, and I was joining the communications team there. And we talked a bit about what one of the main jobs for a communications person working for an RAR would be. And what I was told was, well, convincing people to adopt IPv6, to transition to IPv6. <laughs> that was 2003, so 18 years ago. Um, the job in an RAR communications role has not changed <laughs> that much at this point. Um, this is still something that we're, we're working on. So to explain a bit about that, IPv4 it was um, the original flavor of IP address first deployed in 1982, it's based around 32-bit addresses. 
So that means it's two to the power, there are two to the power of 32 unique addresses in the IPv4 address pool. That's around 4.3 billion. Um, if you if you see an IP address, it, you'll probably probably be quite familiar. It's like an example is this 192.0.2.130. Um, it's written as four octets separated by periods. That's how we recognize an IPv4 address. Now, those four billion addresses at the time when the um, IPv4 was being deployed seemed like probably enough to get by with. Um, that there wouldn't necessarily be an internet so large that there would be a need for more than four billion addresses. Uh, but really by the end of the 80s, certainly early 90s, it was clear that that was not going to be the case and that there was going to be a, a need for many more addresses. And throughout the, through the 90s, through a number of processes, IPv6 was developed. Um, there is a reason why it's not IPv5, but it's not a very interesting one. Um, IPv6, this was based on 128-bit addresses. So instead of 32 ones or zeros, it's now 128 ones or zeros. Um, and that equates to, well, the number you see on the slide there. I think 340 trillion, trillion, trillion is, is often how it's described. Um, and it's written differently. So you'll see it um, there is an example. It's written using double colons. Um, uh, Semi it's written using colons, and you can also have double colons, which would represent multiple values between them of zero. Um, the main important thing to know about IPv6 is that it's not backward compatible to IPv4. So a packet sent on IPv4 cannot directly go to an IPv6 address. So what there's been a need for is this transition, this idea that we will move from and I, an internet which is primarily defined by packets going between IPv4 addresses to an internet which is defined by packets moving between IPv6 addresses. Um, and that has not been going terribly well. Um, it, it, that process began in around 2000. Um, and if we jump to the next slide here, you can actually see um, what the situation is today. Um, this is a graph that is available on APNIC website, APNIC, I think it's labs.apnic.net. Uh, very straightforward to find. Um, what you're looking at here is the results of an ongoing um, measurement and analysis that APNIC does, actually using Google Ads um, to test what whether machines in a, in a given area are actually capable of using IPv6. Um, and so what we see here is that um, a country like India is actually quite high. About 60% of the machines that get pinged randomly in India are capable of using IPv6. Um, the US, also not doing too badly. Parts of Western Europe, not too badly. A lot of the rest of the world, not great. Probably down around 0 to 10% um, actually capable of using IPv6. And that's a bit of a problem. Um, and I will get a little bit more into why exactly that's a problem. Um, as we go through the presentation. So if we jump to the next slide. Um, one way, the main primary way that was determined to govern this space was the creation of regional internet registries. Um, and their main role is to make sure both that IP addresses remain unique, um, but also that the registration of those addresses is made public. So we have five RAR databases, which have public interfaces, you can go there, see, okay, this is, someone is using this address, who is that? Okay, here's how I find out, I look it up in the database. Um, the RIPEN CC was the first of those regional internet registries. Um, as I say, when it was established in 1992, um, some of the founders there approached um, the person in the US, John Postel, who was currently maintaining the global registry of addresses and suggested that this would be something useful to have, a, a European registry um, that was agreed. And that then over the course of the next few years, APNIC was formed, I think, in 1995. Um, Aaron, towards the end of the 2000s, LACNIC and AFRINIC, both in the, the early parts of the 2000s. Um, and each of those RARs serve members, users in, in their service region. Um, so you would basically choose the RAR that you're going to 
obtain addresses from and have um, be registered with depending on where your operations are. And so these are five membership organizations. Um, most of those members are people who wish to have IP addresses, and that's usually internet service providers. Um, so it could be your phone company, it could be your telecommunication um, provider. It, there are many now just bespoke ISPs, internet service providers. It might also be universities or banks or anyone who wants to run their own network. They come to an original internet registry, they can get the, R, the IP addresses, and then they can use those IP addresses to actually connect their machines, their network, to the global internet. Um, that's, that's the plan for how all of this works. But importantly, from a governance perspective, what we need to note is that each of those five symbols there, Aaron, Ripe NCC, LACNIC, AFRINIC, APNIC, actually represent two things. Uh, they represent the registry, which is the organization, that's the organization I work for, but they also represent a community. Um, so each of those regions has an open community and a registry. Now, if we jump to the next slide, we can see a bit how those two entities work together. Um, at the top there, you have the regional internet registry. Now, as I, as I mentioned before, that regional internet registry will provide, give internet number resources, IP addresses, IPv4 or IPv6, also autonomous system numbers, which is a slightly different um, number, also in use to, to, to define networks. Um, it will provide those to its members. So if you wish to get IP addresses or IP address space, you become a member, you pay a certain fee, and then you can receive the IP address space and have that registered. Now, on the other hand, that group of members is only part of the RAR community. And it's that community, that broad, broader community, that's actually responsible with developing policy. And the policy actually tells the regional internet registry the rules under which it can give out that IP address to its members. And so that community is, well, it's what we would now call multi-stakeholder, although that, that word wasn't really in use when these RAR communities were first de defined. But it's an open community for anyone with an interest. So if you're from government, if you're from law enforcement, if you're a regulator, you come from business or civil society, sort of with a focus on, on human rights, um, or someone in the technical community. So not necessarily running your own network, but with an interest in, in how the internet is developing technically, all of those people can have a say along with the RAR members in what those policies should actually be. And all of the RARs, the process for which un, under which those policies are agreed is consensus. So it's not a matter of voting and one group having a stronger voting block than the other. It's actually about, here's a proposal for a policy or a policy change. Does anyone have objections or reasons for objection? Okay, let's look at addressing those objections, addressing what's wrong here. And can we, as an open community, actually find consensus on, on the best way forward here? So that's a really important aspect of how the RARs work um, and, and what what it is they do. So the regional internet registries as the organizations also then serve as secretariat. So we also facilitate the, the processes that help the, that the communities use to actually define those policies. So that includes meetings every year. Um, it includes mailing lists. And, and you'll find for most RIRs that um, policies, policy discussions ha actually have to take place on the mailing list. Um, and it, that's an interesting um, prescient uh, idea of, of what we now face with COVID is that you can't, policy decisions can't be left only to those who can afford to come to a meeting. It needs to be something that is actually open to a much wider, um, wider demographic of people. And the way to do that is to have, have this discussion take place formally on the mailing list and define consensus formally on the mailing list. Uh, sorry, Chris, uh, just on, on your graphic, can you explain what's the role of the board or advisory council <coughs> in interfacing with the community? Thank you. Yeah, I, I well, interestingly, it's different in different RIRs. And that's, that's um, something that, yeah, I, I haven't really gotten into here. 
in the RIPE NCC or the RIPE and the RIPE community, for instance, there isn't a role for the RIPE NCC board in policy development that comes from the RIPE community. The board is committed, as is the RIPE NCC, to implementing policies. Now, in the APNIC situation, um, the board of APNIC, the registry, actually has to ratify policy decisions that come from the APNIC community. Um, now, I th and that that's different across all of the RIRs. I know Aaron has also has a couple of structures there. Um, I think they have a ratification role for their board, or I'm not. I, you shouldn't quote me on that. Um, but yeah, it it is. It does change a little. And this is probably another useful point to to recognize is that it's an it was an interesting decision, I think, and it happened long before my time to to take a regional approach to this, to say, okay, we're going to define, divide the world into five different regions and allow them to have their own processes, their own policy approach, um, and then somehow make it, it can make it work in a global sense as well. It, I, it now, I think, looks very prescient in terms of it was done because there was a sense that di these different regions are going to have very different um, concerns face very different challenges at different times um, just because of the way the internet developed because of the, the economic situation because of the way politics is working and what we see now is that that was that was a very wise thing to do that these communities really do face quite different situations and scenarios so you have the north american um, situation versus the african situation uh, where African networks are still developing very quickly, American networks, yeah, they're I'm sure still growing, but there are there are many of them. And there's a lot more sort of changing hands, um, mergers, acquisitions, that sort of thing. Whereas with Afri Africa, we're still seeing a lot of new networks developing, um, and that's actually played out in terms of some of the policies that exist in those different country in those different regions. Sorry, um, and I. I no, there's been some discussion on the um, in in this group uh, that I've seen go through past on my inbox about the situation currently with Afrinic um, that they're facing, and I it, I don't don't want to get necessarily into that now. Although I'm happy to discuss it later if if people are interested, um, but it, it really is very much related to that sense that okay, Afrinic, the Afrinic community has decided it wants to have some slightly different policies in place. Um, particularly in, in relation to the transfer and, and trading of IPv4 addresses. Um, and that's that's a problem for some um, some in the community, some some in um, who are in the business of IPv4 transfers and trading. Sorry, does that answer your question, Glenn? I realize it's a bit a bit of a vague response. Yeah, uh, I, I wasn't sure in terms of your graphic the the um because I don't see it there, the advisory council. So, you know, advisory councils can be uh, very much hands-off or can be very proactive to stimulate policy stuff. So, which lends me to the the issue that Bill brought up in terms of rough consensus and, and how active people could actually steer certain policies and, and so unfair, unfair process. So, I, I guess, how do you make sure that you have policies that are Good for the community and good for the the the, uh, the general IP industry as a whole. So uh, perhaps you can address it there. Yeah. No. I I think that's a really. I would almost say it's an open question. It's certainly it's a question that I think these communities are continually facing in terms of okay, and to come back to the the what I was sort of defining as the this presentation. How do we evolve these? Um, policy development processes, these governance processes, to ensure that we're not in a situation where a new or a sector of a stakeholder group or a new stakeholder group comes in and is able to take advantage of the way the system is designed, the way the system works, to push an agenda or, or changes that are not actually for the best interests of the internet itself. Um, I, and I said, I, I think Afrinic is facing something like that right now, but I think it's not something that you can say is, is Afrinic specific. I think Afrinic just happens to be the RAR facing this right now. But the RIPE NCC has also been through those kinds of discussions um, in the past with its its community. Um, and, and I think sort of the, the question of, 
IPv4 um, trading is one particular challenge. And I'm, I'm going to get to that in a couple of slides, actually, what some of the challenges are that we face. Uh, and it, it's, it's meant some self-examination on the part of the RIRs and their communities as to how to, how to avoid those kinds of outcomes. Uh, uh, sorry, again, uh, I'd like to point out a, a great question from Mulud. Uh, he says here, uh, does ripe NCC still distribute IPv4 addresses? Isn't this also slowing down the IPv6 adoption? So he's asking the question, why sell it, I assume, if you, know, if you really want to push people to IPv6? Um, I, Malou, can I, and, and thank you for the question, and it, it is a really important one. If I put, put it on hold, perhaps, just for a minute, because I think two slides from now I'm going to get into some of these questions um, and, and maybe, yeah, if, if I don't answer your question at that point, then definitely um, we can get back into it. Um, so, I, yeah, sorry, I'm, I, don't know, I, haven't, I haven't been scrolling down on my, um, my chat here, so I've missed it myself, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and follow that a little bit. Um, if we can jump to the next, next slide, Glenn, I'll move quite quickly through this one. Um, it, it does bring into place the, the advisory council here, which uh, um, it comes into play when we want to actually develop global policies, global policy proposals. Um, there is a body which is formed from the five communities called the NRO Number Council, and in relation to ICANN, which actually has to ratify global policies, um, it, that NRO Number Council is also referred to and plays the role of the ASO Address Council, so the Address Supporting Organization uh, Advisory Council. Um, in, in, in terms of ICANN. So it, it's again, I think, showing that, um, well, as I said at the beginning, a lot of these organizations, these entities actually play multiple roles in um, quite a complex web of interactions, which I think has um, strengths in terms of governance, in terms of sort of ensuring sort of resilience and redundancy, but obviously makes things a little complicated as well. Um, and that's why we have schools on this sort of thing um, as we as we are right now so if we jump to the next slide here glenn and this i'm sort of starting to wrap up um, in relation to the registry idea here um, i want to talk a bit about the the principles and the challenges that the these rars have principles i think i've spoken about a bit here but it's it's really worth revisiting and remembering that key principle an accurate up-to-date registry of internet number resource holdings. That's really important in sort of ensuring uniqueness, in ensuring that we know who's actually responsible for those addresses. That's the reason that the RIRs exist. And then the second principle, open, trans transparent, inclusive, bottom-up development of relevant policies. Um, that's not a given based on the first principle. I think you could, you could say we're going to have a system to maintain an accurate up-to-date registry that wasn't based on community ownership, community stewardship, um, community-driven policy development. But the, the regional internet registries, this system was established based on that principle that the communities themselves will make the, these policies, the RIRs will be driven by those policies, and that there will be processes for even global policies, uh, policy setting based on the community. So the challenges we face, um, an exhaustion of the IPv4 address pool is the main one. So this is, um, yeah, coming back to your question, Mood, um, about IPv4 and IPv6. So yes, in 2011, the IANA gave out its last slash eight blocks of IPv4 address space to the RARs, the five RARs. Um, over the next decade, um, most of those RARs ran out of IPv4, so they used all of the IPv4 addresses that they had, they gave them to their members, and they've ended up with nothing. Um, that's essentially the situation the RIPE NCC is in, except um, we do get addresses back. So when a, an organization shuts down or goes bankrupt or uh, the addresses that it has um, registered actually come back to the RIPE NCC. Um, now, what that means is that there is a possibility for users to get small blocks of IPv4 from the RIPE NCC. The way we've done it is to have a, um, a waiting list. So if you sign up to the waiting list, 
you can get a slash 24, which is a very small block um, of IPv4 address space um, when that block is available. So when a block comes back into the pool, it will go, go back out to the member who is on the waiting list. Um, if we talk about that as a disincentive for IPv6, I don't think that's what it is uh, because that's a very small um, assignment of IPv4. That's not going to allow you to build a, a network for your customers. But the other thing which is going on is the emergence of the market in IPv4 addresses. Now, I, I don't think it's as straightforward as to say a market in IPv4 address space where people can buy larger blocks from other operators is um, dissuading IPv6. I think there's a lot of other factors that are probably coming into play in terms of IPv6 adoption or the lack thereof. Um, but I think it's it's definitely this the emergence of a market probably plays some role. Um, the more compelling challenge for the regional internet registries is how this changes the dynamic of IP addressing. So what we've done is gone from a situation where we had a pool of IP addresses, IPv4 addresses. Anyone who wanted to set up a network could simply come to an RIR, say, I, I plan to make this network. I need this many addresses. Here you go. Pay, pay your membership fee, and then you can have the addresses, and that's fine. We're no longer in that situation with IPv4. We are still in that situation with IPv6, but people don't necessarily want to use IPv6 on their networks. Um, so what that's meant is that IPv4 addresses have gained value. It's, there is a commodification of IP addresses, and that changes the dynamics hugely. It means that there is an incentive for people to try and get those addresses, even if that means committing fraud. Um, so that changes what the RIRs are facing. Before, there was a huge amount of trust because there was no real compelling reason not to trust the people who wanted to get IP addresses from you. Now, the RIRs actually have to do much more work in terms of identifying, okay, is this really the company they say they are? Are they actually registered? Um, do they have a need for, for those IP addresses? Um, so that's that's changing things and making it a little bit, bit more difficult. Uh, the slow uptake of IPv6 is, is really a challenge. It's something that the RIRs are working with their communities to address, um, but it, it it's it's an, it's a problem for which there is no really simple, straightforward answer. What we've seen is a number of different approaches having success. Um, when we looked at India on that map before, and it's leading the world. Uh, one of the key aspects of that is that those are mobile networks. So these are new mobile networks set up in India, um, which have just been set up using IPv6, and that means that a huge number of new users are coming on using IPv6. That's uh, not something that necessarily happens in other, other countries, although actually we also see something similar happening in the US, driving a lot of the, the percentages there. Um, but when you're talking about, say, Western Europe, where there are already a lot of old legacy networks using IPv4, we're not going to see that kind of change. However, if we look at a country like Belgium, where law enforcement actually had uh, have actually worked with the operators there, because for law enforcement, they would prefer to see users on IPv6, because on IPv4, when you don't have enough addresses, there is a method called NAT, Network Address Translation, which can allow multiple users to use one IPv4 address. Now that's a good stopgap measure, um, and, and many people in the, in the internet, particularly in sort of more developed areas, are using that. What it means for law enforcement, though, is that it's much harder to trace who's actually using a specific IP address at, at a given time. So in the Belgian situation, law enforcement worked with government, worked with local operators, um, and actually came up with an agreement, not even a regulation or a law, but an agreement that they would limit the number of people using a single IPv4 address that was allowed. Um, what that meant for many operators was that the easier option for them then was to deploy IPv6 on their networks rather than trying to constrain the numbers of users on a single IPv4 address. And that, that meant that Belgium was actually world leader for a, a number of months there. I think they've fallen to second or third now. Um, so th there are a number of different ways that this can be incentivized or that this can, that the IPv6 address use and deployment can happen. 
uh, but we haven't struck on a sort of silver bullet yet that actually works in every case. So, and this sort of brings me to the end of the, the registry section. I'm looking at the time here a little, I need to rush through a bit of the rest. Um, the other big, big challenge that we're faced with right now is when RIRs actually come into conflict with local or regional regulation. Um, and that can be either the RIR in conflict with the regulation in its home country, so in the Ripon CC's case, the Netherlands, or if we come into conflict with the laws in countries where our members are based. Um, we've had that, the, the situation that is currently the most pressing for the RIPE NCC, something that we're working with the community, working with governments on, is in relation to sanctions. Um, so we find that because the Netherlands is in the EU and the EU has certain sanctions regimes, um, that's presented challenges for the RIPE NCC in actually being able to fulfil its role, its remit of, of providing address space and registration of that address space to people in all 76 countries. Um, now that's that's a sort of, in many ways, a political issue, um, but it is also an, an issue for the technical community, for, for infrastructure, because that if, if we create a situation where it's not possible for registration to happen, then maybe people won't register. There'll be a black market, they'll, a lot of this stuff will, will go dark. Um, and that really challenges the fundamental principles on the, for why we have these regional internet registries, for why we have this kind of registration. Um, so it's, it's a question of, okay, how do governance processes of the RIRs themselves stand up to that challenge? How do we, how do we sort of work with all of the stakeholders that, that have, a, have an interest here to ensure that that's not going to bring the system down or cause tr trouble for the system? Um, so I'm, I am going to yeah power through the rest here. If we jump to the the next slide, Glenn, and I, but I will go quite probably quickly through this. But I think the root servers um, are, are an interesting parallel case um, of how governance has evolved and and a different look at, at one of the ways this is set up. Uh, this this slide is something I stole from a colleague just as a quick. Um, primer on what root servers are, because essentially root servers are the top of the DNS um, infrastructure or pyramid. Um, if you're looking for a website, example.net in this case, um, you need to know what IP address, where, where you actually find that, that example.net on, on the internet. Now, we can see here it's 192.0.2.1. The way you do that is usually you send a request on your, on your machine to your ISP to say, hey, where is example.net? The ISP will check with the root zone, which is the top, and it will say, okay, this is .net, you go here. Then it goes to .net, .net says, okay, you want example.net, you go here. Um, so there's this process that goes on, but it's, the, what's important to note is that the root is at the top of that, um, and so therefore is, is really fundamental um, to how the internet actually works. Um, I'm not going to get into it. This this slide was taken from a DOH presentation, which complicates things a little beyond this. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that to another someone else to talk about. Um, so if we jump to the next next slide here, um, the interesting thing is that there are 13 of these root root servers um, called by letters A B C D E F G H I J K L M. Um, and they're run by these 12 organizations. And again, I say 14, uh, some familiar faces because you see um, there are a number of organizations here that play multiple roles. So RIPE NCC is there. We're also a regional internet registry. NetNode is there. They're also the, um, an IXP in Sweden and they're home for .se. ICANN is there. They also manage the, the DNS and the, the policy processes around the DNS. VeriSign is there. They're also um, responsible for .com, and they also maintain the origin, the the, um, the root of the root, the, the root from which all of these twelve get their information. The important thing to note, though, is that there are actually fourteen hundred servers around the world which provide this root server um, operation. So, for the RIPE NCC, we have several, like, well, hundred and something. I should look that up. Um, that we provide as K-Root, 
Um, it's, this is distributed in a way in using a technique called Anycast, but it basically means that if you're in Australia and your machine needs to look up Kroot, um, it will go to a Kroot instance that is in, say, Sydney or Singapore, rather than one that's in Amsterdam or Frankfurt. Um, but the other important thing to note is that there is no reason it would necessarily go to Kroot, because Kroot simply has the same information as Lroot or Iroot or Aroot. So it will simply find the closest of any of those and get the information from that. So if we jump to the next slide here, um, which just gives you a quick look at where those are distributed around the world. Um, so I don't need to focus on that. If we go, sorry, to the next one again. Um, the important thing is th these 12 organizations are independent. And this is something that really grew out of the very early days of the internet. This is not a system based around a single entity controlling all of this. It's actually about 12 independent organizations who work closely together, um, but in, in independent ways. And that actually contributes to the resilience and redundancy of the system. It means that if one of these organizations or their, and their root server goes down, the internet is fine. You would actually have to take out all 12 of those organizations um, for something to go wrong. So that's, I mean, it, it's it's really worth looking at. And I've put a few links here. That history of the root service system is a really interesting read because it goes into those principles and that approach, which really comes very much from the technical engineering background of the internet. But the other interesting thing is that the root server operators primarily working as that root server system advisory committee within the ICANN structure, have also recognized the need to evolve that governance. Um, and the way they've done that is a, is a proposal which was first documented in 2018 for actually formalizing some of the, the changes and some of the, the policy development that goes on in relation to the root server system. Um, now that's still the process that's going on actually that, that proposal was made there is a working group that working group is still meeting i think probably COVID has um like everything played some role in slowing that down but it's really interesting and if you have a look at the document to see some of the challenges that they're actually talking about how to address um how to assign a root server to a new operator how to take a root server off an operator for poor performance how to take a root server off for an operator who's actually gone rogue. And that, I, that's the term they actually use in the document. And it, it's interesting that this is happening at this time because what we're also seeing, and another discussion that the RIPE NCC is very involved in, is that we're now seeing regulators, including the European Commission, taking a much stronger interest in this and actually working this into their legislation, their legislative proposals, such as NIST 2, which is this update to the Network Information Security Directive, um, which would actually bring root server operators under that EU definition of critical infrastructure providers um, and place obligations on them. Now, the discussion that RIPE NCC is having there, as well as the rest of the root server operators, is to say this is not something that needs to be brought into state legislation, um, particularly in just one region. That, that, that would be very strange. Um, but there is an onus on the, the operators there to also provide evidence to sort of show that actually this is taken care of. This is not something that, op, op, that regulators need to worry about because the systems and the processes and the, the backups and the redundancies are in place to ensure um, that this, this is not going to be a problem. So that's, that's an interesting evolution that's also taking place. And I'll jump quickly, if, if we can go to the next slide through um, the, and the stewardship transition is one other example. Um, and I actually went back to some very old slides here and I, this quote from Narani Nimpuno, who's a member of the RIPE community, currently works for the London Internet Exchange, links. Um, yeah, the INS stewardship is the internet's largest single global multi-stakeholder policy development project. Um, and I mean, <laughs> when you think about that way, it, it really is quite remarkable um, what happened because this was at the very pinnacle of the technical governance for the internet, um, which had always existed under stewardship of the US government. 
in 2014, the US government actually said, we want to pass off this government, this stewardship. We want to pass off this stewardship to the global community. Now, I mean, that's surprising in any case to see a government saying, we're, we want to pass on and um, give up our responsibility here. We want to take less power. Um, but the other interesting thing is that the, the confidence and the, the, this actually expressed in the idea that there was a global community that could step up and take control of this, um, that could take that stewardship role. That that's a really one of the very one of the first and certainly one of the most in, um, impressive demonstrations of yes, multi-stakeholder governance processes actually do exist. They actually have substance. This is not just a sort of a passing fad as to how how, how we can do this. There is a global multi-stakeholder multi policy process to which we can pass stewardship of really the internet's core core function, core registries. Um, so that took place. Uh, if we jump to the next slide, yeah, and perhaps I see where we're going pretty late. This this really just is a, a graph showing the way that the, the that has ended up being. So you have the stakeholders and the users who actually develop the policy, which then guides how the IANA carries out its work, um, which is very similar, well, of course, very similar to the way the RIR communities work and tell the RIRs what to do. The stakeholders tell the IANA what to do and the IANA then manages those registries in an operational way, um, which in relation to the IANA number functions, number registries, means signing and registering those IP addresses to the RIRs who can then register them to their members, which are also called local internet registries. Um, if we jump to the next slide, I think we're pretty much at the end of my presentation here. Um, I really just want to focus, I think, on the, that last point there. I think one of the really key things that came out of that IANA stewardship transition and which really under, undergirds all of the different examples I've discussed today is that accountability. Um, one of the things we talk a bit about is, is trust in this system and the way in the early days that a lot of what the way this was structured, a lot of the way it was governed came back to trust, was based on trust. I think one of the really important evolutions we've seen is away from just trust and to accountability. How do we actually enforce and demonstrate the accountability of these organizations, of these governance processes um, in, in a new environment where really the, the stakes are much higher and the stakeholders are much more diverse and numerous than ever before. Um, so yeah, I think that that's probably really the big takeaway. And I think that's my last slide, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, maybe Glenn, if you want to, I don't know if you want to moderate here. Okay. Um, let, I'm just waiting for uh, people to jump in and uh, give their, their questions. Uh, we can go back to previous in the uh, dialogue. Uh, I'll go back. I think Charles uh, Ulo had a, a comment, and I have to, again, we, we pass this information uh, through the slides well, way back here. Okay, Charles, uh, at Chris Community, which model is using um, the UN? I, I assume that's a question. Which governments are Pacific members? So the interesting thing, and, and this um, is, is an interesting difference between, say, the RIRs and the and ICANN. ICANN has a very formal government involvement process there. They have their government advisory committee um, and there are members of that, that GAC government advisory committee. The RIRs don't have that. Um, we have an open policy development process. So um, our, our message is always that, okay, well, anyone from a government, you can come and take part in this process. You can be part of the discussion. Now, what we've found, and I think that this is something that we've grappled with and are still grappling with and working towards, is that actually an open dialogue, an open process for policy development often doesn't suit a government um, way of working. So you often, whereas you might have one person from a government coming into a discussion either on a mailing list or at a meeting, um, but they, they're just one person. They can't represent their entire government's view without going back to back to capital, back to their, their other colleagues in the government. Whereas the RIR process is very much based 
like the IETF um, around, okay, everyone comes in as an individual, they may have all other affiliations, professional, government, otherwise, but they're, they're operating as an individual, bringing in concerns or points and making those, and then that, that feeds into the discussion. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, I think something, another area where there may be evolution um, in the coming years. I think we're sort of seeing ways to, to sort of more effectively have governments take an active um, role in our, our policy development because they do have an interest. Um, it's just that, yeah, they haven't, haven't really had the chance to be terribly active in the past. Um, okay, so follow up with Charles's uh, question. Uh, kindly also share the issues and problems. I know it's a legal issue right now with Afrinet. I, I know you have to be careful, but what are, what are the key issues and problems uh, facing Afrinet right now? We understand that their assets are frozen. So is there something you carefully can sort of broach on, on the Afrinet issue? I, I would be very careful in, in talking about it. I, and I mean, this is, it's something that is ongoing right now. Um, I, so I, I really only can say what's what's on the public record. Um, but I mean, I, the situation is one where a member of Afrinic objected to a decision that Afrinic as the, the registry had taken, which was to deregister some resources. Now, Afrinic had made, taken that decision based on the policies of the Afrinic community. So it was doing what it was supposed to in that, in that regard. Um, but the, the member obviously did not agree with that. They had a different interpretation of what those policies should be. Um, and, and at that point, yeah, they sued. They have sued Afrinix. They are working through the Mauritian um, court system. So, I mean, the, 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 the legal side of it, the court issues, certainly is not something I can comment on or would want to comment on. Um, what I think is perhaps interesting from a, an internet governance perspective is that sense of, of this being a, a, a change or this being a situation which is driven by the fact that if you take those IPv4 addresses away from that member, they can't actually get other, other IPv4 addresses from someone else uh, or from another RAR. Um, that, they're probably gone. And to get back those addresses would cost them an awful lot of money by purchasing them on the market. So you have a much stronger incentive for conflict there between the members and the registry um, in, in, in case of disagreements like this. Uh, so that, that's something that I think all of the RIRs need to be aware of and managing the risk, um, making sure we're doing our jobs correctly and in, in line with the policies and making sure we're, we're talking with our communities. Um, but yeah, I think I think this is something Afrinic is, is working through now. So yeah. Great. Uh, one, one last question from Kay Mohan. Uh, he asked, are the RARs bound by ICANN's policies, their terms and conditions? So the RAR ICANN relationship is actually quite um, complicated. Uh, the, the primary relationship is that ICANN, or a subsidiary of ICANN, PTI, operates the IANA number, number registries. Um, now, ICANN actually does that, PTI does that, um, under contract to the regional internet registries. So, and that, that's a result, a direct result of the IANA stewardship transition. Since that transition, the RIRs themselves, as representatives of the, their communities, therefore the global community, are responsible for the IANA functions. They have contracted ICANN as a party to do that. ICANN has then contracted, passed that contract on to their subsidiary PTI. So that's the primary relationship. The other relationship then is that, and this is a little bit more historical, is that the ICANN board has a role of ratifying any, poli any global policy proposals that come through the RAR communities. Now it's, role, I think, and I don't think I'm saying anything too controversial here, but the, the role of ratification for the ICANN board there is essentially just to say, yes, this the process has been followed correctly here. All, all of these five RIR communities have followed the process. It has been done correctly. Therefore, this global policy proposal can go through. Um, so th those are the primary relationships. Now, the RIPNCC has a, an additional relationship with ICANN in terms of 
we are also root server operators. Um, and actually, a Ripen CC employee, Kaveh Ranjbar, um, is the RSAC, so root server operator um, advisory committee liaison to the ICANN board. So he's an ICANN board member. Uh, so yeah, it, as I said, it gets a little complicated when you delve into all of the different relationships, but that's, I think, primarily the way it works. Great. Um, I think we've wrapped up the time. Uh, thank you again, Chris, for, for your generosity today for joining us. And uh, um, one last question to you. Um, do you have, I know the RERs have uh, academies. Uh, do you have uh, a similar to what the other RERs have? Do you have uh, any online courses or materials? We do. We actually we do. Um, I, I, so if you go to the RIPE NCC website, which is RIPE.net, um, you'll you'll be able to find um, the RIPE Academy there, and it's it has online courses. It actually also has a certified professionals um, course, which means you can get digital certificates, which you can use on LinkedIn, etc. To demonstrate that you've done specific courses. Um, so this is, and they're primarily uh, technical courses. So it's about um, either setting up a, a, an LIR, becoming a member of the RIPE NCC or using the RIPE database. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a fair bit of um, content and resources on that website. So RIPE.net, you should be able to find your way. Great, thank you again. And, and thanks for the support to, to VSIG and your time, time today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today and the recording we made uh, and uh, available on our Playlist channel. And again, uh, thank you again uh, for everybody joining us today, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Lynn.